everybody. Welcome. It's great to see you all. Hopefully uh, you can hear me. All right. Yeah. Feel free to uh, un or put your camera on if you and open up the chat if you have questions along the way. I am traveling, so I don't have my usual uh, computer equipment with me, but is everyone able to hear me all right? Who's here? Okay, great. I see lots of thumbs up. I have a, a handout, which you don't really need. It's more of a reference for after the fact, but I'm going to go ahead and drop that into the chat. On most computers and such, you can um, take it out of there, but also Jessica is going to put a copy of all of this onto the ICA YouTube channel after the fact, and that will be there. Okay. Oh, for some reason, uh, it's not wanting to go in there. So I'll try it again later if that doesn't work. Just, oh, here we go. I think it's going in there now. Um, so that is our handout for what we're talking about. Our subject today is one of the best ways to learn a new piece of music. We have about 40 minutes. We could talk about this for three to four hours very, very easily. But with that in mind, um, I'm just going to give you some of my favorite approaches and then some of my favorite tricks for particular aspects of learning a new piece of music. And there's some tools that I'm going to use today. Uh, so I'm going to start by um, just talking about how I've changed a little bit my approach to new pieces of music. I think when I was younger, I got a new piece and I would just like play it through and go, oh, this piece is really cool. And I'd probably play all kinds of wrong notes and you know, do all kinds of stuff. And then I'd go, oh, I want to play that fast bit really fast. And I'd play it fast with sloppy fingers, but it was really exciting and it gave me an adrenaline rush. And then I learned all kinds of bad habits. And when it came time to refine that piece of music, it, I had a lot of bad habits to unlearn. So I have changed my approach a little bit, which is to when I'm now learning a new piece of music, I'll definitely look it over to get the broad picture of it. And we're gonna, I'm gonna share some examples and show you how I do that. But I also now will work on a very small part of the piece, like the first two bars, and work on it until I've worked on every aspect of the music. You know, typically the first things we look at are the rhythm and the fingering, you know, which of course we have to know to get through stuff. But after I do that, then I'll be thinking about, you know, then after that we might get dynamics in there, we might get articulation in there. But what we often neglect is the musicality and the expression. I think often we think, oh, well, that's the last thing we want to add. And more and more, I believe we succeed a lot more as musicians if we very clearly have in our minds the musical style and the musical story that we want to put out there to our audience. I think all of us have had experiences where we've been deeply moved by a musical performance and usually it somehow touches us emotionally. So I feel whatever stage of player we at, whether we're relatively new to clarinet or been playing for years, we want to reach people emotionally and really have the music mean something. And I'd like that to be in our minds um, early on as we learn a piece of music. So I'm just going to put up for you a uh, two pieces of music that I selected here that are, um, I think, representative of, you know, fairly easy etudes that might be the kind of music that you would all play. And let me just um, share this so you can all see it. Okay, hopefully you see two Denman's etudes here. These are just uh, nice little clarinet etudes. And the first thing I will do with a new piece of music is look at it for clues to the style. Let's say I don't happen to have a recording of this piece in front of me. And um, what I'm going to do, hold on, my computer is freaking out a bit, so I'm just turning off something that I think is contributing to that. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So I want to look for clues in the music. And here's what I'll do. I'm looking at the one on the left, the Denman Sadagio. The first thing I do is I just look at the musical terms that the composer put in there. So when we see things like adagio, we know it's usually a slower piece. Often those pieces tend to be quite expressive for us. Um, we see espressivo, so another clue, this is going to be expressive. I look at general articulation markings. If I see a piece that's mostly slurred, that's a pretty good clue that likely this is going to be more gentle and calm. If I look at the piece on the right, the tempo di cavat, uh, I see that it's cut time, it's faster, I see lots of staccato in there, 
often staccato is more of a lively, energetic piece. So even before I dive in, I'm just kind of looking for, you know, what are the cl clues here as to how I'm going to play it. And this is fairly basic. I'm sure most of you do something like this as well. The next thing I might do before I learn a piece, and, and this is optional, some people prefer to do this, some people don't, but I'll see if there's a recording of this piece out there. And sometimes there's great recordings available, sometimes there's not so great. Even if you're playing um, maybe a pop piece, it comes from a movie, you know, listen to the movie soundtrack. It might not be the exact version that you're playing, but sometimes we can get some really good ideas about the emotional style. You know, what's the mood that I want to create here? Now, I know some people, and this tends to be more advanced people, sometimes don't like to listen to recordings until they've really had a chance to dive into the piece themselves because their theory is, I want to discover my own voice, you know, before I'm influenced by others. And I can see the point of that. But for myself, when I'm working on any serious piece of music, I like listening to other players and I might borrow ideas from them. It might be like, oh, I love the articulation that person used there. Oh, that timbre on that one spot, beautiful. I think we have the advantage of so many good players putting out recordings and I would say take advantage of it if you can. All right, but I wanna share with you some of the things I was talking about as to how I might um, really learn a piece in a slightly different style. So let's take a look at the Demnitz Adagio here. And I'm just going to make sure my original sound is on because that changes when we flip over. Um, I have a tool here that I'm going to try and, and use. And uh, I'm going to share the screen with you. There are a couple of apps that I use in my practicing that I think um, are really useful in I, the names of them are going to be on the sheet that we put out there. One of them is uh, TE Tuner, which is just a tuner. Metronome does all kinds of stuff. I'm going to show you some things from that. There's another app I like to use that I'm going to show you now. And sadly, I believe it's only available for iOS devices. And this is um, Modacity. It's a practice app. And both of these apps have all kinds of um, you know features that we might want to use it for. I'm just loading it up because I can share my phone with you to sort of show you what it looks like. So I'm going to put, first of all, put that music back on screen. And we're going to take a look at the Demnance Adagio. And I'll show you how I might go about this. So what I'm going to do is just try and, and play the very first um, phrase and in this case that's probably going to be the first two bars so let me um do that and this is where i've added something different for myself i record it from the very very first time that i play it and often the first time we play something there's all kinds of things that don't sound so good right i think that's kind of human nature and um things might go wrong so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to play it the way typically it might go if there's some things not going so well. I'm going to record it and then I'll show you the process I would use to work on it. So here we go. So I'm going to listen back. Here we go. try and do usually the first time we listen back to a recording if you're not accustomed to doing this you're gonna think oh that's horrible I suck I sound so bad and we jump into self-critical mode really easy and it becomes so adversive we almost don't want to do it I think recording myself has transformed my playing so what I want to do when I'm listening I want to just kind of make a checklist what are the things I didn't really like. So when I listened back to that recording, I kind of blasted in full volume with quite an accent on the first note, which probably isn't the style that I want in a gentle piece where I want to come in. So I'd say, yeah, my first note wasn't so good. For some reason, I had quite a big space between the first bar and second bar, right? So there wasn't very good connection there. Um, my last note kind of cut off really abruptly. I'm sure there's other things as well, but I record it. I make the note. I try not to be self-critical. I just treat it as an opportunity for improvement. Then what I'm going to do is isolate just one of those things. So let's start with the first note. 
I came in, as many of us do, really accented. I'm going to turn off the music for a moment here so that you can see what I'm doing. And um, what I might do is just take that note and use some different tools to see if I can play it um, more elegantly. So when we want to sneak in on a gentle piece, it really helps to have our embouchure and air set before we start playing. And sometimes when it's a piece like this that starts on a high note, certainly as a practice tool, I'll practice it without tonguing it. And sometimes I'll even just perform it that way because that really helps me ensure that my error is there. So to help me start a high note softly, one of the tools I like to use is to, um, without tonguing, I call this huffing, and it's one of the things on that worksheet, is to just go <sighs> with my air, sort of blast the note kind of loudly, but notice what muscles am I engaging when I do that. And if you guys are muted, have your clarinet out, you can try this. So I'm going to just take that note and go. Now, I recognize that's not how I want to play it in this piece. It's to help me realize what muscles do I really engage when I'm starting a note. And then what I'm going to do is huff gradually softer. Now, for me, I feel it down here. There's muscles that really engage when I'm using my air. And the idea is to now huff gradually softer. As I do that, and you're going to find you, you reach a point where maybe the note starts to crack or it's not so good, but figure out where your comfortable soft point is, then that ha, 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 that starts to become a good point to start. And when I find I do this huffing exercise, I don't really let my air drop all the way to zero between notes. It's just kind of going in and out. So now I'm able to practice that first note. until I like it. And then, honestly, I would play those two bars, record it, listen back. And that's all I'm thinking about correcting is the first note. Then I listen. I might still have that big gap in there. I might still have my last note being cut off, but I listen. If I don't quite like the first note, I isolate it, work on it again, then I record it. Then I tackle the next thing. So putting the music back on, and I'll show you the tool that I am using for this, actually. Um, you can record yourself with anything. What's really easy to use, I'm using the Modacity app to do that. So I think it's going to come on screen in just a moment here. Oh, it does. You know what? In the breakout room, I don't have a way to make myself larger the way I normally would. So um, if you put yourself on speaker view, hopefully you'll be able to see my phone a little bit larger here. Um, so this is what the Modacity app looks like. When I hit record, it records it, and as soon as I stop it, it immediately plays it back for me. And it already takes into account the fact that my phone is likely on a music stand right in front of me. And so it modifies the sound, because usually our voice recorder on our phone, the clarinet, will sound overloaded. So let me show you an example. I'm going to record it again. There's a little microphone button you can see I'm going to hit. I'll play those first two bars again and I'll see if my first note sounds better. I'll listen. Sounds better. And that time I might say, hmm, actually my first note did sound better. Oh, I'm still really cutting off that last note. So at that point, I'm going to work on the last note for a bit. Uh, maybe I'll just play that note and try and um, using the same engagement muscles, just <laughs> practice almost as Mary was doing earlier in her master class um, with Troy. How can we use our air and embouchure to go softer? Then I just push the record button, play it again. Uh, let me make sure I can see the music. Here we go. button. Play it again. Uh, let me make sure I can see the music. Here we go. So you can
can see how easy that tool is to use because it just records it does it if I wanted to download any of my recordings and save it I can do that but um, it's a really handy tool the other tool that I've mentioned here is the TE tuner and um, this one I'll just let me just share my screen again I think it's really slowing down my computer so I'm going to show you a couple features on it and then I'm going to turn off this setting so that um, the rest of my stuff will work. The TE tuner has, um, if you look at the bottom of the screen here, it has the tuner mode. What's kind of fun is if you're in tune it makes a lovely little happy face. It's so satisfying. If you're out of tune it'll look very concerned. Right, so it really gives you great visual feedback. But another thing that I really like to use is if you look on the bottom here, in the middle, there's one that says analytics. If I click on that, it's almost like an e, like like a heart monitor of what I'm doing on my clarinet, and this will give me information. One of the things when I get to the next piece, we'll talk about. We often have tonguing that's really heavy. And um, if I have hammer tonguing, you can almost see what the profile of what that looks like. So do you notice how I have these huge spikes and fades? And this is something that almost all clarinetists fall into doing. And sometimes it's really helpful to have visual feedback. So what I might try and do is see if I can get instead of these definite dips in sound, can I get it to look more like just a square of notes? And maybe I'll, I'll improve it as I go. So watch how the line works here. Let's see. Okay. see you know a little bit of a spike when we tongue but now it's much more even in fact if anything I'm really connecting my air through and the green line in the center means I was in tune if we go back to my um, hammer tongue often when we hammer our tongues hitting the reed really hard and it sags and we go flat that yellow line down the center indicates that I was flat so there's all kinds of fun things we can do with this. The other exercise kind of related to what we were doing with air that's really fun to do with this analysis mode and TE tuner is available for Android and other things. So you can do something that um, where you just practice crescendoing and diminuendoing and it helps us refine our air control so that we can sneak in softly and grow and we can do last notes and that would look something like like this. Um, I just call it diamonds. We want to try and make diamonds in the tracks and that's actually fairly challenging to do. So um, that's just a tool I wanted to show all of you because I think it really helps us to um, give us some visual feedback. Unfortunately um, the program that shows my phone is uh, kind of freaking out my computer. So I'm gonna just go back to my regular camera now and go back to the pieces of music. Hopefully you guys can see me. I'm going to um, go back to our music and talk about some other things that I would do with it. So let's um, put those two pieces of music back on screen. Uh, so this idea of doing two bars until it's really good. Here's what I love about it. I think you guys still aren't seeing me. My apologies. Um, let me just try and get myself back on. I'm actually performing in a uh, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan tonight, so I'm uh, not in my home base. Okay, great. So this idea of going really deep on two bars, what I love about it is that we record a short section, we improve one thing, and then when we listen, is we kind of get that hit of satisfaction. Oh, that thing's better. Then we record, you know, then we fix the next thing. What's important is that it's one thing at a time. This might take me 10 minutes to do the first two bars, but here's what also happens. 
my body starts to adapt to the concept of, oh, in this piece, I'm starting first note softly. I'm ending last note softly. And when I go to start the next two bars, I've already practiced those tools. So it becomes much faster. I also, we often have this phenomenon if we record ourselves or when we're playing, we hear the world's most beautiful music and we think we're just expressing like the best opera singer in the world. And then we listen to a recording and it sounds so like flat and boring. And then we think, oh, my recorder must be broken because I was way more expressive than that. Well, yes, sometimes the recorder can affect it, but usually something happens when the music goes through the clarinet, it's like the clarinet muffles it and we need to learn to emphasize it, to exaggerate it. And recording is one of the best tools to do that. It's very objective. So, you know, ask yourself, it's possible. Maybe you thought you were emoting like crazy and you're not. And this has helped me become a much more expressive player. So I think I save time in the long run. So my first practice session, I might only get through the first two lines of a piece, but the rest of the piece that has the same mood becomes much faster. And now I'm approaching it with a, a real attention on the musicality, the style that I want. Yes, the tools are there. If my tone was blasty, I might have had to work on um, voicing and stuff. And in a minute, I'm just going to go through some of my favorite tools for working on things. Um, same thing, when I go through the demnants, I would record maybe the first three or four bars and then listen to it. If I have hammer tongue, I'm going to work on that. But the theory is just little, little bits. As we get to know a piece, then we string the bits together. So if I was working on the Denman Sadagio, I might start two bars at a time. Then I might say, okay, I've done all that. Now I'm gonna record the first eight bars, listen back. I might notice that when I played in a longer stretch, maybe my octave slurs aren't good. So I go back and I isolate that spot and work on it. Then I put you know, bigger and bigger sections together until I'm recording the whole piece straight through. But what I want to share with you is very quickly, as much as we can in the 10 minutes or so that we have left, um, some of my favorite little tools that when I hear something on screen that I don't really like, uh, that I can use to refine my playing. And again, um, when Jessica puts up the replay for this, she's going to have that video available to download. And I'm also, I dropped it into the chat earlier. I'll drop it in the chat again before we leave. But here's some of my really quick practice tools. So um, if fingering is an issue, which it often is, and by fingering it can be anything from our fingers don't move well together or it's really fast and we want to refine it, there's any number of fingering exercises. Again, we could probably do a whole breakout room just on fingering, but here's some basics. The position of our hands and fingers has a big impact on how well we can finger. So we wanna go for rounded fingers, light fingers, when it gets hard, we usually start lifting them up and smacking, and that's going to slow us down. So we want to train them to be really, really relaxed. So one of the things I love to do when I'm working on a new piece and it's hard, I hold the clarinet beside myself. So my hands are kind of in a normal position, but it's not in my mouth, and I just do the finger pattern. Maybe I love to do four or five notes. I might just go do 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 What I'm doing now is I'm so relaxed, my fingers are moving so lightly, this is sending the message to my brain, this is easy. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at my music and there's something hard and my brain goes, ah, that's really hard. And instantly I want to just like, you know, tense up. So uh, let me see if I can show. So yeah, you know, this piece that I'm playing tonight that has all of these like high notes and weird trills and fast stuff. If I let that tension go in, it's going to slow me down. But instead, if I'm just fingering it lightly, I do it until it feels really easy without the clarinet. So I want to isolate just the fingering. Then I'll pick up my clarinet and maybe play those notes in a loop. So maybe I have five notes going up. As a practice tool, I'll go up and down and up and down and up and down. Maybe that's not in the piece, but it's just training my brain and body to feel more relaxed on that pattern. So doing it without playing your clarinet first is a really good strategy just to ensure we have that relaxed, arched, rounded fingers like Mary was saying earlier. Okay, next on the list, and I'm just doing this very quickly here. Um, Oh, other things, of course, too, when all of the notes are the same value, like we have a whole run of 16th notes, 
there are many um, videos out there. I've got some, Josh Gu has some who's here, a quick start clarinet. I'm just playing them in different rhythmic patterns. So our fingers are still doing the notes in the right order, but we're giving variety to our brain. You can also think of the pulse being in a different place. So maybe it's 16th notes going do do dee da dee da dee da da. If I just pretend like the first note's a pickup to the second note, ba, let's see, ba dee da dee da dee da dee da. It, it like totally feels like a different piece to our brain. It's incredible. And if you are playing a piece and it comes out unevenly, you know, do ba dee da dee da dee da, where some notes are short and fast, switching where we think of the pulse can radically help us. All right. Articulation. If there's tonguing and slurring patterns that are tricky, so in other words, maybe it's kind of, there's some slurs, there's some tonguing, and it just tangles us up and slows us down. We isolate it by speaking them first. So let me show you an example of that. I'll just take the piece that I was, the Demnans Gavot. Maybe if I'm looking at um, bar 12, let's say for some reason that was slowing me down. I want to speak it. I say T for the tongued ones and sort of just ye for the slurred. I would speak bar 12 going T, ye, T, 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 ye, T, T. And if you're trying to speak something and you find yourself going T, ye, T, 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 like your, your brain is confused, that's a clue that it's not feeling easy yet. And so you speak it slowly until it feels easy. Usually by the time I can speak it fluidly, T, ye, T, 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 ye, T, 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 then if the fingering's not an issue for me, I pick up my clarinet and it works really easily. So speaking first, speaking and articulation is a really useful tool to help us learn a piece faster. Um, again, the, the common theme is here. I'm picking one thing to concentrate on and I'm trying to practice it without even blowing into my clarinet because then there's other things distracting my brain. So I'm isolating as much as I can what I'm working on. Um, another good thing is if there's one articulation style, we're going to try it just on one note. So let's say that, um, I think I'm still sharing the gavotte. Let's say I have this light, light staccato here. And when I listen to my recording, maybe I, if I were, let me play bars, the end of bar two into bar three, maybe I sounded something like this. You know, I think I'm playing light and bouncy and I listen, I'm like, oh, that's actually really heavy, really accented. I will just take one of the notes and work on it there. So I'm gonna think, okay, I'm hammer tonguing. Let's keep my tongue closer to the reed. Let's touch it more lightly. I'll start by just doing legato. That's all I'm concentrating on is not moving my tongue much and not slamming it into the reed. Once that's going well on that same note, then I'll, I'll gradually make it shorter till I have uh, more staccato. Once I like the style I have on one note, then I can try playing the rest of the notes. But often our bad habits come in pretty quickly. You might find something like this. I, I sort of reverted to hammering partway through. If you hear that, then stop on whatever note you're hammering and fix it there. So sometimes I'll just do each note a few times. This is another good tool. It's much easier for us to correct articulation when we're hanging out on one pitch, because again, our brain is not distracted. So I also, on my worksheet, say you can use that TE tuner to see what the air looks like to look at the analysis of it. Um, if rhythm is an issue, we isolate the rhythm. Everyone should have, uh, everyone, I highly recommend you have a system for interpreting rhythm, you know, some way of clapping and counting it, sort of a one and two and, and we work out the rhythm again without our clarinet. So you can have your system of clapping and counting. Again, there's lots of resources out there. I'll try and um, send some links to Jessica that she can put up with the replay for you. Another great one is turn your metronome on, tap the beat all over your body and sing it. I'm gonna um, make myself bigger so you can see this. I think for many people, this helps revolutionize their sense of rhythm and pulse, which is um, if my metronome is going, let me turn on a metronome here. So if I have a metronome going and I simply tap in time with the metronome all over my body, this is every time I touch a different part of my body, 
there's some neuron that goes into my brain that's attached to that part of my body. So now my shoulder's rhythm, my forehead's rhythm, my hip is rhythm. It's firing off in our brain in these really profound ways. And if I do that while I'm singing the music, so I'm looking at what's on the music, I'm singing it. You don't have to sing in tune, it doesn't matter. You're just singing for yourself. This really helps our brain and body to develop that sense of pulse. Many of you, a common thing is I'll say, I can play fine with the band, but when I play by myself, I just don't know how to count it. Probably means you have good ears to adapt to the rhythm, but you can develop a better internal sense of pulse and tapping all over your body is one of the most powerful tools that I'm aware of that helps us. I know we just got the two minute warning there. Um, so one other tool I'll show you quickly and then the rest are written on the sheet. If you are listening to your recording and you notice your air is uneven, we all have a tendency to kind of hoo, 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 to, I call it accent and fade. Our breath likes to emphasize each note. Um, sometimes you can use what we call the whisper technique. That's where we open our jaw, we drop it, really loose, so we're just blowing air through the clarinet. Then I can kind of hear what my airstream is doing. And if we're in that habit of fading, we'll hear it. I might hear this. I don't know if you can you hear my air going through there. Yeah. So what I want to do is listen for it being smoother. I want to imagine my air is just a river and then I can hear that. Here's my challenge to you. If you're trying whisper technique, do it as loudly as you can. You run out of air super quickly, but it really helps activate your blowing muscles. So it's kind of a bonus. It helps you smoothen out your air, but it also helps you blow more deeply into it. Um, all right, I know we're gonna get kicked out of here. Like I said, there's so much we could have done in here, but I just wanna summarize, record yourself. Do it, do it, don't be critical. Use it as an opportunity to improve. Record very short sections so that you have in one practice session a success experience. You get to say, wow, I made those two bars sound amazing. Then it's motivating. And some of the tools I mentioned will help. I, I, I think any moment we're magically gonna go back. So I wanna thank you all for being here today. It was great to see you. Um, and if you have questions outside of this, feel free to contact me offline. Just michelle at clarinetmentors.com. I'm happy to help you out. Um, if anyone has a question, I'll try and answer it, but I think we're going to magically disappear any second now. But if you have one, just unmute yourself, fire away, and I'll answer it until we're out of here. Where do I find these resources? I don't know where to find the music and different things you've referenced. You know what I'm going to do, Mel, when we go back to the main room, which is in 54 seconds, I'm going to drop my handout in the chat. So if you have a computer, you can do it from there. Otherwise, go to YouTube in about a week, the International Clarinet Association channel. Just yeah, I just looked there to look for it and uh, I don't see oh, no, anything. Yeah. She will put this video of our session up and the handouts will be underneath that video. So it's, it's gonna, she's gonna take a week or so to, to get all these videos edited and ready. Yeah, so this was great, Michelle, like, as usual. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you all of you for coming. I think we can now leave the breakout room and head back to the main session. Really appreciate y'all being here and uh, see you next time.